Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art, and I am waiting in my car uh, for a, a friend of mine I had to drive to the doctor, and I thought I'd make an effort to see if I couldn't read a few pages here instead of waiting till after work to read. So, you know, type A personality, have too much on my plate. So I'm going to be reading from uh, pollution, uh, what's it called, Population Control for Nuclear Pollution, and we are on uh, Chapter 5, Lip Service to the Public Health, page 63, The Wonderful Promise of Nuclear Explosives. Clearly the most potent approach to the entire problem is to cut off the release of dangerous radioactivities at the source, be they nuclear reactors, nuclear explosives, or radioisotope shipments. But atomic energy was still at, at that time hailed as a wonder child, like they are now. Nuclear explosive weapons were to protect us from would-be aggressors by the mechanism of a balance of terror. Peaceful nuclear explosives were going to do immeasurable and remarkable tasks for man, including digging harbors, making cuts through mountains, digging interoceanic canals, breaking up natural gas formations to stimulate natural gas. That's what they're doing now. It's called fracking. And a host of other unnecessary tasks. And nuclear reactors were being developed for distant space propulsion as well as for electric power generation here on Earth. No one in 1963 was seriously even thinking that the most effective way to cut the hazard was not to do the program leading to the release of radioactivity. Programs were regarded as sacrosanct, like they are now. But we realized that the time might come when precisely this recommendation ought to be made. Stop that particular AEC program as dangerous to and unneeded by society. But such a recommendation, if made, had to be backed up by sound scientific evidence. 1963 was not the time for that. We set about diligently to do, to do work in all areas just described. The scientific data required appeared endless, and neither we at the Lawrence Laboratory nor the officials at the AEC headquarters expected that the experimental work required would all be done at Lawrence. Indeed, it was expected that we would all pull together from researches, past and ongoing throughout worldwide laboratories, identify crucial missing information, and do or get done those experiments required to fill the gap in our knowledge. All this started with much enthusiasm and a high sense of purpose in the spring of 1963. A number of events followed in sequence that gave us real pause in our concern about the seriousness with which the AEC regarded the important mission they had assigned us to. It actually read, had assigned to us. He wrote it correctly. I read it wrong. <laughs> Shortly after the Livermore biomedical program had gotten underway, one of us, Goffman, was called back to Washington for a, quote, important conference, unquote, at the Division of Biology and Medicine at the AEC in Washington, D.C., a conference on the subject of radioactive iodine. The subject was certainly of interest and directly a significant part of the considerations which had begun to occupy our attentions in the new work. But it turned out that the purpose of the conference could hardly be designated as scientific. What had occurred was that an employee of the AEC Headquarters Division of Biology and Medicine, Dr. Harold A. Knapp, had assembled available evidence from past nuclear weapons tests and had concluded that the radiation damage received by the children in the state of Utah from such tests had been far in excess, and this is in italics, far in excess of anything predictable from the past safety announcements of the AEC. He wanted to publish his findings openly. AEC was extremely worried about the impact of his publishings on this, this data. In essence, the message to our community assembled as a conference was, how can we stop this report? 
a report which will, in effect, make the AEC reports over the past 10 years look untrue. Dr. Knapp was unjust, was, I'm sorry, I'll start again. Dr. Knapp was justifiably furious at the AEC efforts to block his report. To the credit of the committee members convened and to review the Knapp report, they recommended early publications of the Knapp report in spite of AEC headquarters objections. Dr. Knapp published his report and resigned from the AEC staff. We had our first direct taste of what Dr. M. King Hubert, uh, Dr. M. King is a research ge geophysicist, U.S. Geological Survey. We had our first taste of what Dr. M. King Hubert so aptly described as AEC, sanitizing and cosmetizing a sci of scientific reports before release to the public. The scientific findings of Dr. Knapp, that, that much more inquiry had occurred from radio iodine. I'm sorry. The scientific findings of Dr. Knapp, that much more injury had occurred from radio iodine than previously admitted by AEC, have never been refuted. Never been refuted. Indeed, a subsequent report by Tamplin confirmed and extended the findings in essential agreement with Dr. Knapp. And there is a footnote to that. You can get that. Not long thereafter, we came to learn more about the seriousness seriousness of the AEC desire to have a real evaluation of the true impact of radioactivity release upon man and the biosphere. Word filtered into Livermore that the biomedical program was in trouble. Why? Apparently, in their haste to get something done to appease the public indignation over the Utah fiasco, the AEC commissioners had approved the program at Livermore in the absence of one member of the commission, James T. Ramey. Subtitle, A Cut in the Budget. Upon his return to Washington, he was apparently furious that the program had been initiated without his approval. It was made clear to us that Commissioner Ramey disapproved of the program strongly and that there was a danger that the program might be canceled. Apparently, it would have been too embarrassing with the extensive AEC publicity about the program to cancel it outright. Instead, the budget was cut even from the low starting value and we were given to understand in no uncertain terms that the program was not going to be supported at the level required to do the task outlined originally. Hmm, wonder why. We were faced with a dilemma. The work we felt was of supreme importance to humans, to public health, and to the welfare. Several of us had uprooted our lives, our previous profession, professional associations, and family to undertake an important task in the national interests. We would be able to, would we be able to continue the work? Was it worth trying to continue in the face of obvious lukewarm support in Washington, if not outright antagonism? Dr. Foster, then director of Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, was reassuring. We would have the support of the laboratory and the university. The AEC wouldn't dare offend the university by simply canceling the program outright, even with Mr. Ramey's outspoken antagonism. Besides, we were assured that after a while, Mr. Ramey would get over his peak and become friendly to the program. But that was not to be. The fight for a new biomedical complex. I think I'm going to stop there. I have read two pages, but I think I'm just going to make this short because I think my friend's about to get out of the doctor. So I will talk to you guys later. I think I will read a little bit more, but um, I'll talk to you later. Ciao.